In this episode, we're going to take a look at the kit and equipment a member of the 6th Battalion King's Own Scottish Borderers would have been carrying, using and wearing for that matter uh, during uh, mid-1944, so post D-Day, Northwest Europe. Now, Monty's men, for anyone who doesn't know, is a coming together of uh, premier living historians, all in the effort to have as an authentic experience as possible. And we put this to great effect and brought it to fruition once again at a place called We Have Ways Festival. So anyone who knows Al Murray, James Holland, they have a fabulous podcast called We Have Ways of Making You Talk. They have an annual festival and Monty's men were invited to come along and display at the event and just add that little bit of extra spice and flavour to the event. So in this video, I'm going to go through the full kit from head to toe that I took to the event. There's two types of headdress I took to the event. So first piece of headdress we've got here is the Tamo Shanta, complete with the Leslie Tartan patch and the KOSB or King's Own Scottish Borderers cap badge as well. So this was worn when we were off duty, when we were sort of uh, not necessarily in the line, shall we say. And the second piece of headwear I took along was this. This is the Mark II helmet, the Tommy helmet, the classic Tommy helmet from World War II. And it's an original shell. It's actually a 1939 dated shell. It's got an original liner in it as well. And what I've done is I've actually recreated the camouflage as per a training pamphlet from 1943, as used by troops in Normandy in 1944. And that is to put some hessian underneath, to tie a piece of string around the outside of the uh, sort of bottom of the rim here, and then to put a net over the top and to add scrim. The only thing that's not seen here is the uh, foliage, which would have been added to the scrim uh, net on the top, onto the helmet net. Uh, because it depends what terrain you're in. So whatever terrain you find yourself in, you would pick uh, leaves or branches or even long grass and you would put it in to help break up that silhouette. But there we go, there's the headwear that I took to the event. The uniform we've got here is just standard British soldiers uniform of the Second World War. Starting with the collarless wool shirt. So you can see this is in the sort of green serge wool material. Uh, nothing fancy about it, it's a collarless shirt, you've got buttons on the cuffs and you've just got a slightly longer back to the shirt than the, uh, the front. Other than that, it's just a very, very basic shirt, nothing fancy, just purely serves the purpose. Now moving on to the battle dress uniform, we've got what's called a set of austerity patterns. So this will often be called 40 pattern by uh, reenactors, it's not the official designation of this is austerity pattern. It's the austerity pattern brought in to help save money, time, materials. That's why. Wartime economy came in and this is the simplified version of the battle dress surge, the first pattern of battle dress. So very high waisted garment. So this comes up uh, very high on the waist. Uh, you'd wear these either with a, uh, a belt, like a new three pattern belt for instance, that's very common, or with a set of braces. Again, it's personal preference, you don't have to, it's up to you which one you want to wear, somewhere both, somewhere none, but hey ho. Uh, you can see that the, there's no covered pocket button here on the flap, so you can see that's austerity pattern. Um, so flipping these over, there's no belt loops on there at all, it's a simplified version of battle dress, nothing fancy at all. Um, these are actually made by a company called What Price Glory Century Europe, in my opinion the superior uh, reproduction battle dress company out there. If you're going to get yourself a quality pattern battle dress, there's only one company to go to, that's what price Glue Century Europe. You'll pay a premium for it, but it's worth every single penny. And it really does feel, um, you feel like a million dollars when you're wearing a set of battle dress that fits you properly. And of course, no battle dress is complete without the blouse. So again, this is the austerity pattern battle dress. So we've got no pleats in the pockets. We've got uh, no covered buttons here either. We've got the metal uh, sort of uh, buckle on the waistband belt there. We've got exposed buttons on the cuffs. And as we're portraying the key King's Own Scottish Borderers, the 6th Battalion, here you can see the, uh, the Leslie Tart and the Division Flash and a single arm of service stripe there as well. I didn't have a rank for the event, I just went, as I pretty much always do, as a private and just as a little bit of added authenticity in the pocket we have a reproduction AB64 so this is a soldier's service and pay book 
The whole mantra and ethos of Monty's Men, for those who are not too sure what Monty's Men is, is to recreate a company of men as they would have been at a specific period of time in the Second World War. It's all about authenticity, carrying the right things, eating the right things, doing the right things, even saying the right things. And it is a real pleasure to be part of that illustrious company, uh, a band of brothers, if you will. They're doing an event in 2023, September next year. If anyone's interested in coming and taking part, let us know. It is always an absolutely incredible event of living in the field as a British soldier for four days. It's amazing. Can't recommend it enough. We have a few more items here, starting with these. These are fibre identity discs introduced in 1916. Two fibre discs. Each disc has a service number, my surname and first initial, and uh, my religion on there as well. Uh, in the event of the worst happening, uh, the one disc would stay with the body and the other would be taken away to inform uh, family and so forth. We also have a pair of reproduction wool socks. Again, it's all about the authenticity with Monty's men. Even the things that you can't see as a member of the public, they have to be right for us. They have to be bang on to give us that full uh, immersive experience. So these are reproduction wool socks, almost identical to the ones worn by the British soldier of World War II. Originals are very hard to come by. We also have these, a, a set of 37 pattern uh, web anklets. Uh, one left, one right. These are what go around the boot and over the trouser and you blaze the trouser over the top. These weren't officially part of the 37 pattern equipment, I have to add. These came in very shortly after. Initially, it was intended for putties to be used, but uh, they very quickly adopted these instead. We also have a scrimnet scarf. This is a two-tone scrimnet scarf as issued to every British soldier of World War II from about 1942 onwards. Synonymous with uh, corps like the Airborne, but the ordinary infantrymen had them too. And you can see this in uh, extant uh, photographs and so forth from the period we're portraying of mid to late 1944. And the final item we've got here is a pair of very fine reproduction boots. Now, these have been freshly dubbined so they smell beautiful. Anyone who's ever used dubbing, you'll know what I mean. And these are reproduction boots by a company called uh, William Lennon & Co. These were purchased from Epic Military. They hold a very good stock and their prices are very competitive as well. I have very large feet. My feet are size 13 and they're very wide, so it's hard for me to get original footwear. Um, occasionally size 13s come up, but not in a, in a wide fit. These are a wide fit and these are the proper ripple rough side out uh, leather. Uh, I haven't burned them down. Many people say, oh, you need to burn them down, but they didn't do it in the Second World War. These are a pair of field boots and not for parade. Um, but these are dubbined as per the anti-gas instructions during World War II. And of course, they're hobnailed uh, with toe plates as well. And they are a fine uh, piece of equipment. Here we have the 37 pattern web equipment set. It's Blancoed in KG3 Blanco, so very late war. It's worth saying that KG3 wasn't universally used by the army uh, late war, but a few corps did use it, and we've narrowed down that the 6th Battalion KOSB did indeed use it, so here we are. We have the standard skeleton set. We don't have the uh, haversack or small pack here at the moment. That will be in a segment very shortly, so stand by on that. But we have, just as a quick sweep, the water bottle, the entrenching tool, and helve. We have the uh, pig sticker bayonet. We have a basic pouch with two Mills bombs in and another basic pouch with two Bren magazines in. Now we also have this, which is the lightweight respirator haversack. Um, I have to say all this webbing here is original. All the items you can see is original um, British, uh, except for the, the two cross strap braces. But the whole contents of this is original. So we have, we won't get it all out just now. Uh, we've done videos on this before, but we have the eye shields in there. We have the cotton waste. We have the anti-dimming kit. And we also have the uh, anti-gas ointment and the, the lightweight respirator itself as well in there. So just before we go on to look at the armament of the soldier of 1944, this definitely needs a mention in its own right. So this is a general service shovel. Now, every member of a British infantry section had a piece of uh, general service uh, sort of equipment, whether it be the shovel or the pickaxe. And you'll see this being worn a number of ways. My favoured way is to tuck it into my webbing and have it at my front. 
But you'll also see guys putting it down the back of their haversack and having it behind their head as well. But if you're going to do an impression for a British infantryman, 1944 in Northwest Europe especially, then this is a standard piece of equipment you're going to need. The mainstay of the British infantry section was its riflemen, and they were armed with this. This is the number four Lee Enfield rifle. Now, for all intents and purposes, it's the same rifle as its predecessor, the short magazine Lee Enfield, used throughout the First World War and into the first half of the Second World War. But this does have a few refinements. So rather than having the volley sights just here, it has these drop sights instead. So a bit, bit more of an economy version in that sense. The bolt is exactly the same. The magazine's the same. The rounds are pretty much the same too. Now, the only thing that's different, and that's at the business end of the rifle, so you can see the muzzle is markedly different to the short magazine Lee Enfield. The reason for that is to accept the new version of bayonet. So rather than having 17 inches of sword bayonet you had with the SMLE, you now have this, the pig sticker or spike bayonet. And that slots on to the muzzle like so. And it's been developed specifically for urban warfare. So for those guys going into Normandy and into Caen, this is where it's going to come into its own. It's not as cumbersome. When you aim the rifle, you're not going to lose that balance point either. It's just a bit more of a functional rifle, and it's also cheaper to make as well. And the round being used in this was the, the 303 round. We have a bandolier of 50 rounds, so the guys were carrying extra bandoliers of rounds with them. You'll see these typically slung across the uh, chest or tied around the waist. And these are what is inside. So you have 10 of these clips, which each contain five rounds. So you've got 50 rounds total, and you'd put 10 rounds total, so two clips, into the magazine of the rifle. Here we have the basic contents of the haversack, or small pack as it's also known. So we have a spare pair of wool socks. We have the brown enamel mugs, so the late war issue. This would have been suspended from the strap on the outside of the haversack. We have the woolly pulley, very popular bit of kit. V-neck jumper, you'll see people like Monty typically wearing that. We have the sterilising outfit. Uh, it's got two little glass bottles inside so you can sterilise water uh, to make it safe for drinking. Uh, so you have the, the white tablets and the blue tablets there. We have the uh, Tommy cooker, so this is a, a tri cooker, uh, a burner. The Tommy cooker was issued alongside the 24 hour ration pack, which you can see just here. Uh, we have a set of mess tins, a small and a large mess tin. We also have the, uh, a fuel tin here and a refill for the hexamine fuel for the Tommy cooker. We also have a boiled sweets, salt and matches tin. Uh, so it does what it says on the tin. You've got your boiled sweets, salt and matches in there. That comes out of the compo crate. We also have a tin of boiled sweets and also the emergency ration tin as well, which has a, a slab of uh, high cocoa content chocolate inside. And there we go. There's a snapshot of the kit that a private soldier of the King's Own Scottish Border 6 Battalion would have been carrying in Normandy in 1944. And again, the same kit as I used for a recent event with Monty's Men. If you're interested in getting involved with Monty's Men, then give us a shout. They're a fantastic group of guys and they've got a trip planned for September next year and I'm very much hoping to be on it. And of course, if you want more from Living History UK specifically, then become a member. The link is in our bio. You can always send us a PayPal donation too. But the main thing is you guys watch our videos and you enjoy and learn from what we do. Till next time, keep history alive. The sun rise behind